Good morning, Elmbrook Church. It is so good to be with you. Now, I know that guest speakers are supposed to say that, you know, it's so good to be with you, but truly, it is so good uh, to be with you. As Jason uh, mentioned, I was the high school pastor here in the 90s, like into the early 2000s, way back in the day when fashion had its look for sure. Um, and uh, when our family left uh, at that particular time, this is how we looked. Uh, there's me and Jen and Kara, Elise and Lauren, so cute. And here's how we look now. Um, and so what this picture proves is something quite simple, that the Argue family has achieved our family goal, and that is to look more like Abba. <laughs> we were actually in a city, and this guy with an accordion was playing something, and our family walked by, and he started going, Mamma Mia, here we go again. <laughs> Seriously. Um, but truly, I am so glad uh, to be with you. You know, uh, Elmbrook is the place where I had my first internship, uh, and I got to step into this place. And Chuck Weathers, facilities, facilities director, wherever you are, I just want you to know that game with the melted butter in the kiddie pool in Fellowship Hall, that was not my best moment. I'm really, really, really sorry uh, about that. My wife Jen and I, we got married here, which is amazing. Um, and, uh, and then um, Stuart asked me to be the high school pastor here. And if you know Stuart, he said in his profound British way, Stephen, anything that you can do uh, uh, badly is worth doing. And so I'm like, oh, okay, well, great. I can do that. I can do something badly. And I never knew what would happen. I never knew as I stepped into this high school pastor position that you would trust me with your kids. And that these amazing kids would share their lives uh, with me. I've, I've seen so many of them grow up and find their way and find their voices. And sometimes uh, I still run into them on social media or when we come into town. And quite frankly, all over the country as I speak in different places, like all of a sudden there'll be this random uh, student that will come up to me and I'll see. And I just think to myself, unbelievable. How has it been that I've been able to be a part of this. And I've also been part of this community as we've gone through really, really difficult times as well. I've said goodbye at funerals to some of my best friends in this space. Um, I have done funerals for people that you have loved. And I am certain, I am completely certain that whatever I said at those funerals was probably weak and pathetic, but you let me stand with you. And in those moments, I don't know who was ministering to whom. Thank you. And, you know, as I think about these experiences that I've had at Elmbrook Church, it has rooted and, and gotten hold of my heart so much that it has actually shaped the work that I do today. The reason I research young people, the reason I advocate for young people is because of the deep and profound experiences that I've had at Elmbrook Church. Elmbrook Church, it is so good to be with you this morning. Thank you. <laughs> now, I was taught something here at Elmbrook. I was taught that it doesn't matter who you are, if we gather to reflect on the Word of God, that somehow, sometimes, in some way, we can hear God speak. And so it's with that anticipation, and it's with that hope that we can turn to the Scriptures right now. And I'd ask you to turn to 2 Timothy chap uh, chapter 2. Um, if you use the Pew, Pew Bibles, it is uh, page 964. Four, I think that's right. And, uh, and if you have like a Bible app, use it. We're not going to think you're checking your email. We're totally certain that you are reading the Scriptures, and I'm totally cool with that. Okay, you ready? Here we go. This is uh, the passage Paul speaking to his uh, protege, Timothy. You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses and trust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. Join with me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets involved and tangled in civilian affairs. Rather, they try to please their commanding officer. Similarly, anyone who competes as an athlete doesn't receive the victor's crown except by competing according to the rules. The hardworking farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. Reflect on what I am saying, for the Lord will give you insight into all this. Remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, descended from David. This is my 
gospel. Now, as I mentioned, um, I study the lives of adolescents and emerging adults and the way that they navigate, especially their, their spiritual lives. I also study congregations and the ways that they attempt to support young people in their spiritual lives. But you don't need to be a researcher or you don't need to be a pastor to recognize the fact that we are experiencing in our culture today a bit of a disconnect between congregations and people, and especially young people, and young people typically get the brunt of the critique. A lot of church types will say, young people aren't showing up at the ch at church because they don't like the church, or they don't like Christianity, or they don't like God. Now, while that may be an interpretation, I think it is a bit unfounded, and it isn't very helpful. Because what I find as I work with young people, and as uh, we do research with them, I am finding that young people, like all people, are looking for good news. They will gravitate toward good news, and the challenge and the problem is, is that they're not finding it in our churches. And what they discover is that there is a dissonance that they feel, a dissonance between what the church says and what the church does, and they label this dissonance hypocrisy. They label this dissonance uh, inauthenticity, and they label this dissonance sometimes as, uh, uh, as that of being unsafe. The number of conversations that I've had with young people saying, I think there's something at the church, but tell me, Steve, is it a safe place? Now, there is no finger pointing. We don't need to blame or shame and say who's at fault. But I think what we have to consider is this. How can it be that there are congregations in our country that care about people, and I believe deeply care about young people, and there are young people searching for good news? How is it that we can't get together? What on earth is going on? And this is where I think this passage might be able to help us. Because I think what's happening here is we see Paul telling Timothy some significant things about what the gospel is all about. Now, there's three, quickly, three things that I want to set up, and then we're going to get into what we're going to talk about. First of all, we recognize the fact that Paul, in staccato form, sort of describes what the gospel is. Now, there's a backstory to that that we don't have in this particular passage, but as Christians, we know this, that God's gospel is simple. God is pursuing the world, God cares about God's creation, and God is putting the world back together. And that is not hopeful thinking, it is rooted in the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ has come to this earth, has died our death, has risen again, and we are living out the echo effect of the resurrection where God is putting every atom of this world back together. That is the hope that we have as Christians. And as we continue that hope, we recognize that God is continually doing that. How is He doing that? It's not the what, it's the who. We see in this passage that, the, that Paul says, it is entrusted to us. Who is the body of Christ? We are the body of Christ. There is no one else. And we have the privilege of joining God and putting the world back together. Now the challenge is not in the what, and the challenge is not in the who, the challenge is in the how. And what we see in this passage is Paul says this how is not just words. That, uh, that is the what. The challenge is in the embodiment of the gospel of how we actually live it out. And Paul gives us three examples of what that looks like. He talks about soldiers, he talks about athletes, and he talks about farmers. And so what I want to do is I want to un unpack those metaphors and see if we can understand and maybe give some legs to this idea of the how. Now when Paul talks about soldiers, I think the how comes through in this way, that we proclaim the gospel when we are able to say to others, I'm for you. I'm for you. Now, soldiers in Paul's time would be Roman soldiers. Now, a lot of times when we think about soldiers, we think about them out fighting battles. But the most time is usually spent for a soldier is actually in the civilian towns. Their job was to keep the order and keep the peace in particular towns, all right? Now, they have been bestowed upon them authority and power given to them by Rome, and that is backed up probably by the outfits they are wearing of which they would have their full regalia. Now, in that moment, as a soldier that has power that has been given to me, I have a choice. I can use my power for the benefit of others, or I can use the power for the benefit of myself. Paul would say the former is the gospel, the latter is not. Now, we are not Roman soldiers, last I checked. But I do know this, is that we all have power. 
We have power to use for the benefit of others, or we have power to use for the benefit of ourselves. And I think though we often say that we are for others, a lot of times what happens is we turn around and we use it for ourselves because we want to protect ourselves. I see this in two particular ways. One is I see it in what I'm going to call, and it's a little bit dramatic, but I think it's important. We see it in the ways that we talk about and think about propaganda. When I get afraid of something that I hear that I don't know what to do with, when I see a person that I don't completely understand, when I have a situation that I don't know doesn't fit with my worldview, the instinct of the human condition is simply to say, I don't believe that. And so what we do is instead of taking in that information and trying to think about how we incorporate it into our lives, we try to shut it down and say, that's not true. That can't be the way it is. And we use our power to speak over the other voices that we hear so that we don't have to change our view of worldview and everybody else does. My friends, that is not the gospel, that is propaganda. At the same time, we oftentimes will do something quite passive, and I would call this privilege. If I am a person, especially if I'm male, if I'm white, if I'm straight, if I'm married, if I'm suburban, I live in a world that's made for me. Now, I know that I should care about the injustices of the world, but if the world leans in my direction, and if it gives me an advantage, I can feel bad for everybody else, but in the day, it doesn't affect me. It's like being a soldier on the corner of a, of a neighborhood, seeing an injustice and turning the other way, turning a blind eye. We don't have the privilege to do that. If we're not careful, I can say, I'm not racist and still benefit from a racist society. If I'm not careful, I can say, I'm not sexist, but I can benefit from a sexist system. If I'm not careful, I can say, I don't make as much money as my neighbor, but in a capitalistic society where the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer, I'm still benefiting in some, some sort of way. And so the challenge that we have is to make sure that our gospel does not turn into that completely of, um, of that either, of privilege, okay? So what do we do instead? How do we be for someone? How do we consider what it means to live out this gospel? Now, I think what we could maybe think about it is in this way. My wife, Jen, and I, we used to have in our, in our living room a sign. And this sign reminded us of something really, really important. It said three words. It said, tell me more. And I can't tell you how helpful that phrase was. When my daughters came home and they said, okay, this is what's going on in my life and I want to jump in and fix it, I just stopped and looked at that picture and go, wait, before I say one word, I need to listen to her perspective. When we have friends come over and we would disagree on something socially or, or theologically or whatever, and we'd be debating about things, I could look at that picture and say, wait a minute, I need to hear this perspective. You see, if we're not open to the perspectives of others, what happens is this, is we have a narrow view of the world. And last I checked, none of us are God. We do not have an objective view in the world. Instead, we have to recognize the fact that the world is more complicated than we re ever realize, but the gospel is also good news. It can be just as complicated as well. And when we do that, we begin to recognize the fact that we can see other people for who they really are, rooted in a deeply Christian understanding that everybody has a name, everybody has a story, and everybody's created in the image of God. Now, when we begin to think of it that way, and we begin to say, I'm for you, I'm willing to listen to you, I'm willing to listen to your perspective, and I might even be open to change, when we do that, we echo the words of Jesus on the night that he was betrayed. He took the bread, and he took the cup, and he handed it out to his motley crew of disciples, none of whom would probably be able to be members in any of our churches. And he says, this is my body and blood for you. My friends, that's a game-changing gospel that's good news for everyone. Now, Paul talks about soldiers, and then he talks about athletes. And I think not only does this, does this idea of athletes think about this idea of, um, uh, you know, soldiers is about I'm for you. I think that what we can think about with athletes is this, is that I think we proclaim the gospel when we say that I am with you. I'm with you. Think about what this might mean for a second. Now, Paul says that athletes uh, compete according to the rules. I think another way for him to say that is, look, there's no shortcuts, right? We love the big game. We love dreaming about, like, 
uh, riding in the Tour de France. But in the end of the day, the work is in the 5 a.m. workouts. The work is in the blood and sweat and tears of the daily work that goes into athletic training, which is no different than the spiritual lives. We are wrestling on a daily basis with what's right and what's wrong and what I believe and how I live that out and what that begins to look like. And as I've studied students, one of the, uh, two of the things that students say back to me as they wrestle and work through things is this, is that oftentimes they feel a sense of vulnerability and they feel a sense of anxiety. On top of that, we know theologically and sociologically that we are relationally bound together. So if you and I are friends or you and I are related, and you express to me in something about your spiritual journey, something about your life that exudes some sort of vulnerability or some sort of anxiety, in that moment, I will also feel my own anxiety and my own vulnerability. And then I have a choice. I can step into that space with you and work it out with you, or I can step away and hope that you figure it out on your own so that I don't have to feel my vulnerability or my anxiety. See how that works? Now, Paul uses an athletic uh, example, so I will uh, as well. Um, as Jason said, I'm a marathon runner. It's something I like to do. And for those of you that maybe know a little bit about running or about marathon running, you know that the training in marathon basically comes down to teaching your body to run a long time. And um, so in my typical training routine, there is a point in my schedule where I'm running three to four hours, okay? Now, I do this near my neighborhood, and I, there's this four-mile loop that I like to use. Now, a four-mile loop running three to four hours is a lot of times around a loop, but this is where I have to go. Now, I run counterclockwise. Now, in this particular morning, I saw another man coming the other direction while running clockwise. He was an older gentleman. He was wearing a singlet that said, running man. Awesome. So jealous of that. <laughs> now, if you, if you know anything about, like, uh, you know anything about, like, math? I mean, if, if he's going clockwise and I'm going counterclockwise, we're going to run into each other quite often over a long period of time. So there's this thing that happens with runners. When you see a runner for the first time, you give the runner's nod, okay? It's just like an acknowledgement. It's kind of the cool way to do things. But after a while, if you see a runner over and over for hours, the nod turns into a thumbs up. The thumbs up turns into a wave. And then pretty soon, you're just seeing each other. You're just like really excited because you're like, we're all crazy. Yes. And um, <laughs> so I I'm on about three hours and I'm running and running man comes around the corner. And I'll tell you something. I am tired mentally. I am tired physically, but running man sees me and he can tell I'm struggling a little bit. And he stops in the middle of the road and goes, you go, you go, you go. What do you think I did? I was like, yeah. So I finished that and I'm feeling absolutely great. Okay, now just hold that story for a second. There's another part of the story. So now I'm, I'm running the LA Marathon. And for those of you that uh, probably know, there's something in uh, marathon terminology called the wall. The wall happens somewhere around mile 18 to 22, it depends on the person. And uh, this, this, this wall, this space in mile 18 to 22 is the place where you are doing a self-check on where you're at in your race. And one of two things is happening here. Either you're feeling good and you know you're going to beat the race. You're going to run your time, you've got a 10K to go, and you're going to do all right. The other thing that can happen is that sometimes the race can beat you. Your body is shutting down, you didn't do it quite right, and now you're just hoping to finish. Mile 18 to 22 is the most vulnerable space in a marathon race. Now, I'm at mile 20, LA Marathon in this vulnerable space, trying to check out my body, wondering how I'm going, going to fin finish this. And to my right, there is a row of people in lawn chairs with giant venti Starbucks and donuts. <laughs> and they see me going by, and it, like in sync, they all raise their cups and they say to me, you're almost there. Now I am a minister of the gospel, I teach students how to be ministers of the gospel. And in that moment, I wanted to diverge to the side of the road and knock out those coffees in each of their hands. <laughs> Why? Because comforting words from comfortable spaces are never comforting. 
Comforting words from comfortable spaces are never comforting, right? Who did I think of in that moment? I thought of my running man. A running man that says, you go, you go, you go. What does it mean for us to be with each other? It means getting closer than we think we're able to. You know, in Christian circles, when we think like we can somehow shout from a distance some sort of encouragement, praying for you, Bible verse, you're going to make it, buckaroo. You know, that actually hurts more than help. What we want is for people to come close to us. Do you know someone who's struggling? Struggle with them. You know someone who's depressed? Hang in there with them. Do you know someone alone? Reach out to them. You know someone that's hurting? Hurt with them. You know someone that's searching? Search with them. You know that someone's confused? Be confused with them. Be with them. Be with them. This is what the gospel is about. And when we do this, we echo the very words of Jesus, who on the day that he ascended, he gathers his disciples, some of who doubted, and those, by the way, are the most honest people in the group, and he says, the Great Commission, and then he says this, I will be with you always to the very end of the age. Now let's think about what that means. The Lord Jesus Christ, who lived our life and died our death and ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father, is not sitting on a lawn chair with a venti and a donut saying, you're almost there. Our Lord Jesus Christ says, I am with you. I am with you in the darkest spaces. I am with you when you don't know what your next step is going to be. I am with you when you are confused. I am with you when you are down. I am with you. I am with you. I am with you. And he whispers in our ear, and don't forget, you go, you go, you go. My friends, that is the gospel that is life-changing and is good news for everyone. We proclaim the gospel by saying, I'm for you. We proclaim the gospel by saying, I'm with you. And we also proclaim the gospel by saying, I believe in you. Paul turns to this picture of a farmer, of which I feel least qualified uh, to talk about. But I know this, that there is always, no matter how much technology we have in this great state, to think about farming, I know this, that there is an act of faith where we take a seed and we put it in the ground, believing that somehow it's going to be a good investment. Jesus talks about the kingdom of God this way. Jesus says, you plant, you water, I'll make it grow. You make the investment, I will produce the fruit. The problem is in our society, and sometimes in our churches, we have reversed that. We say, we want to see the fruit, and then we'll decide if this is a good investment. And so we live in a world, especially for young people, where we are judged, where we are expected to produce and to produce and to produce in order to somehow demonstrate our worth. Love is conditional, always with an if. Work is seen as something where you just have to kind of pull it up by your bootstraps and do it by yourself, and we're not going to give you any credit until we actually see you're worth it. This is the opposite of what the gospel is all about in the ways that we think about the kingdom of God. It's the truth uh, also with spirituality. So in some of my research with college students, uh, they told me this. They said, as I am wrestling with my faith, and I think about what I've learned growing up, and as I'm uh, in, uh, in work or in uh, education, or as I'm thinking about my life and I'm having these new experiences, sometimes there's a dissonance between what I believe and how I think the world works. And I have to figure that out. But that is not what bothers me. They told me, they said, Steve, what bothers me is this, is that if I voice that I'm doubting, if I voice that I question assumptions. If I voice that there might be a different way to look at this, that my mother will be upset, that my father will be angry, that my youth pastor will be disappointed, and that my church will put me on the prayer list. And ladies and gentlemen, nobody wants to be on the prayer list. <laughs> do, you, do, you, do, you hear, do you hear what they're saying? They're saying that When they raise intellectual doubt, they're not worried about the intellectual side of things. They're worried about the relational fallout. You know someone who's doubting? The last thing you need to give them is another book. What they need is to be believed in. They need to know that no matter what they believe, 
but you're not leaving them, that you believe in who they are, that you're not giving up on them, that they're on a search that is honorable and beautiful, and it's going to be okay. I think oftentimes, as we think about uh, young people, we realize that if they think about this idea of relational fallout, that they just live with fear, fear of stepping into this place, fear of being found out. But it's not just the young types, it's the older types as well. Maybe it's not fear that they have, but maybe it's shame. Shame that we haven't lived up to what we said we had hoped to do. Shame because something that we've built has fallen apart. Shame that we realize that we have our own hypocrisy. Shame, shame, shame. And so there's a lot of churches around here, I think, that have this idea that if I have fear and shame, we're all like coming to church hoping that we don't be found out for who we really are. Because if that were to happen, I'm certain that somehow we'd be ostracized from this place. When did the church become a place of fear and shame rather than love and grace? When might we continue to grow and elaborate this idea of love and and grace. It's hard enough out there. Young people are trying to make it in a world where the rules are constantly changing, and older types are trying to remain relevant in a world that is addicted to new and improved. We can do better. We can do better because the gospel says, look, we can believe in each other. We can proclaim, I believe in you. We can say to one another, you are a good investment. What if we caught each other doing things right more than catching each other doing things wrong? What if we could call out the best in each other? What if we could say, that thing you did right there, do it again, do it again, do it again. What would happen? I'll tell you what would happen. People would be lining up in the churches around our country because all of a sudden we'd be going, you know what, that, co that community right there, they believe in us. They're willing to take a risk with us. They're not waiting for us to be perfect before something that happens. Instead, we have this opportunity to actually be invested in. And this is when it gets absolutely beautiful. And I think when we do this, we begin to echo the words of Jesus. All through the Gospels, we see Jesus constantly saying to people, believe in me, believe in me, believe in me, which is incredibly powerful. But I think the reason that Jesus says this is because there's a subtext, and the subtext informs Jesus' call to believe in me. And the subtext is this. When Jesus says, believe in me, believe in me, believe in me, the subtext is this. You ready? Because I believe in you. I believe in you. You are a good investment. Ladies and gentlemen, a game-changing gospel that says, I believe in you, is good news, and it is good news for everyone. So what shall we do? We know what the gospel is. We know that we are responsible in joining God in perpetuating the gospel and the healing of this world. And how might we do that? I believe we can do this by proclaiming to others, not just with our words, but with our actions, I am for you. I am with you. I believe in you. And let me tell you something. I think that there are probably some of you that have just made it in here today by the skin of your teeth. You've had a rough week. You're having a rough life. And maybe what you just need more than anything else is just to know this. Jesus is for you. Jesus is with you. Jesus believes in you, and that's the truth. And if you've experienced that, my friends, then we have a responsibility and a privilege and a joy to be able to perpetuate that, not just with words, but the ways that we are for and with and believing in others. And so my dear, dear friends and family of Elmer Church, may you know that the gospel is bigger than your biggest imagination. May you know that the gospel is not just good news for you, but it is good news for the whole wide world. And may you have joy as you live it out. And with that, I give you God's grace and peace.